Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to another installment of our Brown Bag series hosted by the History Department and the Carney Public Library. Um, we offer these typically the second Wednesday of every month. Um, we, have, we have a number of talks scheduled all the way through uh, next fall. Um, but before I want to introduce today's speaker, I want to kind of point you to the, the upcoming talks that we're going to be having. Uh, the next talk on October 11th is going to be from me, um, and it's going to be uh, the Kearney Incident, UFOs on the Platte River. Um, so in 1957, a UFO landed on the Platte River, and it is a weird and wild story, and we will, we will talk about that. Um, November 8th, we're very excited. April White, the director of the GW Frank Museum here in town, is going to be talking uh, partially part of what she's going to be talking about uh, stems from a new book publication from uh, one of our faculty, uh, Dr. David Vale, and, and director White contributed. Um, she's going to be talking about the Nebraska State Tuberculosis Hospital. Um, we have a full list and a full calendar of other history department events, other, other things on our website. So do please stay in touch. We have all of the requisite uh, social media uh, uh, sites and platforms. So do follow us and the public library. Um, I also uh, want to bring your attention to other library events that are coming up. So uh, October 5th is the one author uh, Carney series, and we actually, I don't, it's one author, but it's two authors this year, so I don't know how you're, how you're doing that. Um, Mary Roach, who, who writes uh, creative nonfiction, really interesting stuff on Mars and sex and animals and all sorts of different things, and uh, Gail uh, Tuskiami, who uh, writes uh, uh, fiction, is, is going to be speaking, um, so there, there's information on that at the table in the back. Um, also, on October 7th, um, as part of the 150th anniversary celebration for Carney, Members of the Pawnee Nation are going to be returning to Kearney. We're going to be hosting events out at Fort Kearney all day. Um, and so information about that is also available um, at the back table. Now, our talk today, Grooming Small Socialists, Propaganda in East Germany's Children Newspaper, 1949 to 1958. Our speaker today is Dr. Torsten Homberger, uh, who is familiar, hopefully, to many of you. Um, he's a native of former East Germany who earned his undergraduate and graduate degrees at UNK, as well as a PhD in modern European history from Washington State University. Uh, Dr. Humberger's research fields include the history of Weimar Germany, uh, Nazi Germany, and because um, he was born in the Stalinist East German state, uh, these eras are, are particularly of interest to him. His family lived through the German Empire, the Weimar Republic, the Nazi di dictatorship, and the Ger East German uh, period. Collective memories, his grandparents' stories, as well as his own experiences put him in a position to introduce these fields as a cultural insider to the American audience. He is also um, the author of, of a, a really well-received monograph on the history of uniforms and, and fashion within Nazi Germany, the history of the SA, uh, which, which came out, well, last year, two years ago, two years ago now. Um, some of you were, were certainly probably at that book launch. Um, but we are very, very excited to welcome again, Dr. Torsten Homberger. my uh, colleagues. Uh, I thank you so much for showing up. This is amazing. Thank you. I'm very excited to talk about East Germany today. Um, I grew up in East Germany, and you'll see there's a, you know, there's a time bracket there, 1949 to 1958. Um, I was sent uh, by the history department with quite a bit of money to, to Berlin to do research, and I, I used that money fairly wisely. I hired a research assistant, and the sheer volume of material that I found in the archives in East Germany was, was so overwhelming that I decided it would be very smart to first uh, talk about the smaller uh, snippet of, of the research that I have. So I'm talking about one specific East German newspaper that is for little kids. And the run that I have, the, the first run that I have is from 1949 to 1958. So that's why these weird numbers, numbers on my title. Um, grooming small socialists. Propaganda in East Germany's children's newspaper. Why does one need to groom small socialists? Uh, the East German state was a construct of the Cold War. It was an illegitimate state, and most East Germans knew that. The Soviets knew that when they established that state, but they also established myths uh, and themes, propaganda themes, around the East German state that legitimate, not, not really legitimized it, but you know, at least gave it a, a story 
And what we should not forget is that the story that the Soviets used to legitimize their empire in Eastern Europe is a Marxist story. That's what we need to keep in mind. And we also shouldn't forget that Marxism is not Stalinism, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll figure out the difference between Marxism and Stalinism. And uh, what, what's really important is that uh, propaganda helped to keep the East German state running. Every now and then you needed people to join the East Germans, people police, the border guard, the military, the party, and those are institutions under weapons that keep the East German state alive, right? And this is what the Soviets and East German authorities did fairly cleverly, right? And what we're doing today is I would like to share my research with you. I would like to share my primary sources. I would like to uh, share my research questions with you, right? So we have a primary source. Um, yeah, ma why is this important? I forgot. Well, of course, it's important because the East German state existed for almost, you know, a little bit over four decades. But it's also important because we are still surrounded by Soviet propaganda. I'm not saying Russian propaganda. I'm saying Soviet propaganda. It is still there and it is alive. And in order to realize or recognize how we are being played upon by the FSB today, the it used to be the KGB, right? So um, in order to realize and see through Russian propaganda today, uh, why not start at the beginning? Why not look at where, where it all originates, the, the early years of the Cold War, right? So this is, this is what we're going to be doing today. Um, so by the end of this uh, presentation, you probably will understand a little bit better why it is very normal and consistent for a Russian media outlet to call somebody like... Um, the Ukrainian president, a Nazi. What, what is he? What is he? What is his religion? Jewish. He is Jewish. He lost ancestors in the show, right? So this is the primary source. This is a uh, first page of um, the young pioneer. Um, this is uh, an earlier run. They changed the outlay on the lay. I'm sorry, the layout and the format a little bit uh, earlier. This is expensive stuff. They spend quite a bit of um, money and time on um, uh, the, the title, right? The Junge Pioneer, up there, the Young Pioneer. Um, this part changes. So for every single episode, uh, episode, sorry, not episode, issue, for every single issue, you have a new piece of art up there, right? What you see here is it's Wilhelm Pieck's birthday. Wilhelm Pieck is the president of East Germany, right? Um, so we have a president, and we have a leader of the party. The leader of the party runs the state. That's Walter Ulbricht, but we also have a president because you know, East Germany looks democratic. <laughs> uh, this is the president's <laughs> birthday. And you see up here, the young pioneers are all running to him and they love him. Uh, he looks very thin in this suit. If you see that man, he's a little bit shorter. He's <laughs> Well-rounded. He, uh, he spent the war years in, in Moscow, right? That's why he survived the, the oh. Stalinist. Uh, Purges, you know, at the earlier earlier purges, but he also survived uh, the Stalinist period. So Moscow came back and becomes the, the East German president. So what do we have here? This is the page of the young pioneer from 1953. Uh, you see, it's you know showing everyone how awesome it is to be a young pioneer. See this gentleman? It is Stalin. It <laughs> is Josef Stalin with little pioneers, right? The größte Augenblick meines Lebens, the biggest moment in my life, is the story of a Russian young pioneer. They meet their leader, Soviet Stalin, uh, Soviet Joseph Stalin, uh, best day of my life. Wow. Right? So this is a typical piece of propaganda from uh, 1953, right? So uh, this specific issue here, this um, um, newspaper ran from 49 to 58, then it changes the title from the young pioneer to the drum. What they're doing is they're going back. The drum used to be a propaganda newspaper in the Weimar Republic, published by the communists with money from Moscow, right? So they're basically going back. So this is this is still in the future. <laughs> Hopefully, you guys will be here again when I talk about my upcoming book and <laughs> put all of that together. <laughs> but for now, what I would like to do is discuss the, the early period and why, because this is where Soviet propaganda was shaped. Right? This, this, this is what we're doing today. So this is the primary source. 
Okay, um, I'm East German. <laughs> okay, I'm laughing. Um, my, my family survived the Soviet dictatorship, right? They also survived the Weimar Republic and the First World War and the Second World War. I know all of this stuff, but some of you don't. Uh, while I was coming in, I heard you know people in the audience talking. So this is after the war. Okay, what happened? Hmm. This is this is what happened, right? You need to know the background and who are the Nazis, who are the fascists, who are the Soviets, and you know what what happened to Germany. Okay. So in 1939, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union together attacked Poland. That's the beginning of the Second World War, right? Um, we know that uh, Nazis are aggressive. The fascists were aggressive. They took over their, their neighbor, right? The Soviet Union did the same thing from the West, but they argued in a typical Marxist way that they're only protecting the workers of Eastern Poland. They're not you know, they're not working with the fascists. Yeah, they have been working with the fascists. You know that. Historians know that there was a secret treaty that they uh, that they all agreed on. And, you know, the Baltic countries and parts of Poland, you know, were part of the Soviet Union from 1939 on. Then, in 1941, Adolf Hitler turns the table, as you know, it attacks his former ally, Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin didn't see this coming. He actually trusted Hitler to begin with. That's when he was absolutely unprepared for what happened, right? The Nazis almost, you know, almost won this war. But then this happens. Uh, the United States jumps in. And without the United States, um, grain, uh, tanks, boots, uniforms, ammunition, uh, moral support, without all of that stuff from the United States, the Soviet Union would have lost the Second World War. This is not a lie. This is not embarrassment. This is true, right? Um, when the Nazis are gone, right, and there is no more common enemy, um, the Western allies see the Soviet Union as, oh, wow, they, they, they're still in Eastern Europe. <laughs> they're still in, in East Germany. They're not going, uh, right? And so the, the Western allies allow Stalin to do that, to keep his Eastern Empire for you know, reasons that just is way beyond this uh, presentation here. So after the war, the common enemy is gone. Uh, and the United States and the Soviet Union realize that they have incompatible ideologies. So they have two, we have two superpowers now. For the first time, um, superpower means that you have two big countries on this planet that have blocks behind them, right? So we have the Eastern Bloc, the Soviet Union and its satellites uh, in Eastern Europe, and then we have the Western Bloc, the United States and NATO, right? background to the Cold War. Um, with these two blocks, with these two blocks, two opposing blocks, um, uh, East Germany is the fault line, right? So we have West Germany and East Germany, right? And so if you want to, if you want to say it dramatically, you know, the, the East Germans were in the, the front trenches of the Cold War. Absolutely, we were. Don't forget that the Berlin Wall was built in 1961. Right, so every East German from 1949 until 1961 could basically try to go to the West by, you know, over the green border, or basically all you have to do is you go to Berlin, go to a subway station in East Germany, take the subway to the West, right? So don't forget, the German-German border is still open, right? That's why propaganda for East Germans needs to be convincing, right? Um, uh, by the way, uh, East Germany was founded in 1949, and NATO was founded also in 1949. Why is that happening? Because the Cold War is getting colder. <laughs> uh, the United States is realizing that uh, the Russians, the Soviets, are not backing up. They're keeping their empire with their tanks. Um, they also have atomic weapons at this point of time, right? So we have now two opposing blocs, West Germany on one side, East Germany on the other side. Uh, in 1953, um, a big, horrible awakening <laughs> happened to the East German uh, dictatorship or to the East German leadership uh, because there was an uprising. Stalin passed away and the East German uh, elites tried to make the workers work harder and give them less money. Uh, the East German workers were anticipating a little bit of a, you know, easing up of the rules because Stalin is dead, was dead. That didn't happen. Huge uprising. At first in Berlin, then in all the other big cities. Uh, they set fire to, uh, you know, police stations, uh, party offices, 
you know, free German youth and young pioneer offices, right? And so it was very, very clear to many that this is an illegitimate made up puppet state by the Soviets for the Soviets for their empire, right? Um, so, you know, the East Germans needed to react. And so propaganda from 1953 onwards uh, becomes a little bit more aggressive, right? Uh, we can see that with the founding of the East German army in, in 1956, 11 years after the Second World War. Um, if you look at pictures of the East German army, they dress like Nazis. They have gray uniforms. The only thing that's missing is the dang eagle on the shoulder. I'm not kidding. They do look like Nazis. And there are reasons for that, right? They want to make that German uniform, or they want to make that German army look German, although it's integrated into an Eastern Bloc military led by Russian generals. It is not a German army. It is a, a, an arm of the Russian military apparatus, is what it is, right? So we'll see that too. Uh, in 1956, there's another uprising in Hungary that is heavily discussed in my, my primary source. So we don't look at that. And then, as you know, we won't talk about this, but the real freezing of the Cold War happens in 1961 when they isolate East Germany. Why? All this propaganda doesn't work. Way too many East Germans vote with their feet and go away. They don't come back, right? So that's very obvious that uh, East Germany is an illegitimate state. And so the um, Soviets and the East German uh, regime build the wall, right? So here are my research questions. This is what I asked my sources, right? So we have about 10 years of a newspaper. Oof, that was a lot of time to go through all of that. It took forever, right? So what you need to do now is sort your evidence. So what, what can we find out with the stuff that we have? So you find research questions. And I always tell my, my students in my, my 803, in my research classes, right? Um, how do we come up with a thesis statement? You find research questions. And the answer to those questions, that's your thesis. Okay. So what are the questions? How did the Soviets justify their empire in Eastern Europe? How did the East German regime justify its existence politically? Okay. Number two, how did the East German regime justify remilitarization? And as I already said, putting young Germans in really weird looking uniforms only 11 years after the war was highly unpopular with the East German populace. No one wanted to see that. Okay, was all propaganda directed at children effective? If we look at how unpopular remilitarization really was, let's see what, what ineffective propaganda looks like because there were some really weird things in the newspaper that when I read them, I'm like, oh my God, you guys would not believe this. I need to share this. And I ran into Nathan's office and I'm like, you need to see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, how was the effectiveness of propaganda enhanced? Sometimes you need to make it look pretty, right? So that this newspaper was mostly, you know, intended for little kids. The propaganda was sometimes so heavy handed that it's difficult for little children to understand the vocabulary. So what you also have is lots of stuff about songs and dancing and new games and literature, film discussions, uh, introductions of new actors, those kind of things, right? So things that little kids actually probably maybe would like, right? Okay, now let's look at the evidence that I found for the first question, right? So is it a German democratic republic or a Stalinist dictatorship? What did the East Germans or the East German government say about East Germany? Right. This is a page of the Young Pioneer about 10 days after the popular uprising. As you see here, um, the title up here is um, simplified. It was too expensive to have this artwork up there, you know, that changes for every single uh, issue. So it's simplified. Uh, the price went down. Uh, if you notice, the other uh, issue was 15 fennec. This is 10 fennec. So it's, it's cheaper. The format becomes smaller. Right, the paper is expensive. So what, what does that tell us? Nobody bought that expensive piece of propaganda, right? <laughs> and they had to make it cheaper, right? And so what we have in this article here, um, Der Heimat die Treue, loyalty to home. After the uprising, uh, we have an article written by Walter Ulbricht, right? So not the president, Wilhelm Pieck, Walter Ulbricht, the guy who runs the party and the state. 
And he basically said, uh, armed fascist bandits from West Germany uh, were parachuted in, right, into East Germany, into other East German cities. And they had radio sets, you know, that they got from, from American, from Americans, right? And these guys then um, attempted a coup d'etat. They wanted to destroy the East German state and destroy the accomplishments of the German workers. But, you know, even young pioneers, you know, what here you about here they say even some young pioneers helped to defend East Germany. Most East German workers stood up and fought uh, those, you know, bad West German agents. Uh, a couple of days later, here, right? A couple of days later. Um, and this is what the provocateurs look, looked like, right? So these are West German fascist rowdies. What do you see there? <laughs> In 1953, young Americans probably maybe also looked like that, right? Jeans, a t-shirt, uh, that, that Elvis haircut with a duck tail in the back, right? He probably has greaser hair, right? He, he looks like a rocker, right? Elvis Presley was very big back in the days. This article is horrible, right? Basically say, and this is what they looked like, the, the parachuted in provocateurs with the radios and the brand and the bombs and stuff, right? <laughs> Texas boy with Western fashion and hairstyle. Um, supposedly, this is a young, young man that actually comes from East Germany. He was too lazy to work, not a good proletarian. Ends up in West Berlin. He gets trained in a fascist agent school, trained for a day X, right? And then day X, he gets caught by the East Germans, people police, and they put him in jail because of the way he looks. Highly unlikely that he was trained for day X. Highly unlikely that this young man is a provocateur agent. He's just a young man who has, who does want nothing to do with the East German state, as his look will tell you, right? Okay. <laughs> Freedom for Lore Schacht. Oh my God, West Germany is horrible. This poor woman, this student leader of West German communist youth, was jailed by the West German fascist government for 22 months, only for hiking and singing communist songs. Hello, what did she do? We're in the, we're in the midst of the beginning Cold War, and what she's doing is she is the leader of an illegal communist organization in West Germany. She probably was told several times, don't do this, or, right? So yeah, you get jailed for uh, joining an e illegal organization, right? However, uh, this article says, oh my God, look at what the fascists do in the West. This young woman is in jail. Write letters, uh, write, write to you people back in West Germany. We can give you addresses. You just have to come to the party offices. We give you addresses from regular West Germans. Write them, pioneers, please, you know. Political propaganda, my God, right? Um, Hungary is free. I mean, when, when I read that article, I'm like, holy cow, what in the world? Black is white and white is black. Hungary also had a very popular uprising against their Soviet occupiers. This article basically says, <laughs> this, this is important, <laughs> what every young pioneer must know, peace and freedom on the Danube is safe. Faked fears of, of liars. Hungary is free. An article that one can also use in class or discuss in your pioneer group, right? So this is the best piece of propaganda. Why don't you cut it out and use it, you know, with other pioneers and stuff? So basically what this says, white terrorists murdered Hungarian workers after deceiving them with, criti with criticizing the government. What this article is saying is that Hungarian workers were deceived uh, fascists told them it's okay to criticize the, the Soviet-run government. Um, um, because of that criticism, you know, that, that opened doors for real fascists to come in, the White Guard, this works back to the Civil War in Russia, right? White Guard, uh, these guys are working against the threats, against the Soviets, right? So now they're superimposing a civil war in Hungary. There was no civil war. <laughs> It was a popular uprising against the Soviets, right? So Hungary is not free. There are no white terrorists. You see what I'm saying here? Black is white, white is black. We are Democrats. They are fascists. Wow. 
Okay, this is, this is fun. A little girl is telling us in this little article what she would do if, if she could do magic, right? If I could do magic, this is what I would do. Um, dreaming is fun. I would eliminate the German-German border. Uh, all industry in West Germany would become property of the state. Okay, so we're taking private property away and, and yeah, okay, mm -hmm, that sounds right, right? We're chasing out all imperialist capitalists and other exploiters. Okay, this is a very big category. Who is an exploiter? Why? But, you know, seems like this little girl here has a dream of <coughs> kicking out quite a bit of people out of their homes, taking their stuff away, right? Right? Oh, yeah, and then she would like an airplane and visit all of her friends in Poland, Romania, and Holland. I don't know why Holland, but maybe that would have been the next goal for the Soviets to get, to get the touch in or something, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, March 27, 1957. Uh, a contract between friends. This little article here in 1957 summarizes that East Germany and the Soviet government have come to an agreement uh, how long Soviet Red Army troops get to be stationed in East Germany. And they're bending over backwards here to basically say they're not occupiers. They're helping us to defend ourselves from the fascists on the other side, right? So it's a contract between France. Uh, Western fascist generals have atomic bombs and rule over the new Wehrmacht. So the West German military, they also have a military just like the East Germans. And, and we call it the new Wehrmacht, the military of Nazi Germany. Okay, right? And they have, you know, H bombs, um, atomic bombs, and hydrogen bombs as well. Come, come to me. Contract between East Germany and Soviet Union allows Red Army limited time in East Germany. <laughs> they left in 1990. Uh, Soviet, <laughs> Soviet soldiers would rather be home, right? They're also sons and daughters of, you know, babushkas in, in Siberia. They'd rather be home, but they can't because they're good sons of proletarians and they're protecting East German proletarians. Wow. Okay. I don't believe that, but this is what they say. It's propaganda, right? Um, here's a warning. And this is really the, the squaring of the circle here, because now we're talking about down for May 8th, Tag der Befreiung, right? And so the day of freedom, right? The Soviet Red Army brought, brought freedom to, to the uh, Germans. Ultimately, this little story here tells of how the Soviets surrounded a Nazi base. The Nazi officers did not want to surrender because what they wanted to do was fight for the last and whatnot. And then ultimately, uh, the, the regular soldiers were supposed to be killed and covering the retreat of the officers. So the, ultimately, the, the Russian general then comes up with this. It's a three-state story, right? And then some Nazis now rule in the West. And that fictitious officer here that they describe in the story Right, and the story is fictitious, right? And the story ends with the fact that this same Nazi officer now is in the new Wehrmacht in West Germany. And those guys run NATO. Bad, bad people who even wanted to kill their own soldiers by the end of the war, right? So some Nazis now rule in West Germany. Okay, remember, the Nazis are gone. The East Germans, some of them were Nazis before they became East Germans. Do you understand what I'm saying? And now they're taking the Nazis out of the equation and saying, no, 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 right? We're all the good guys here in the East, and all the Nazis are in the West, right? This is really this square in a circle. This gets even better, right? Death flies over Western Europe. This is the United States Army. But no, I'm sorry, we have the Air Force at this point of time, right? Um, during the Second World War, these airplanes helped the Soviets to win the war, right? And what is this? It's a death head, right? But what is that symbol? The SS. The SS. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. The SS, right? The real bad Nazi soldiers. They had that symbol on, on their caps, right? So now this is a real nice mix. Looks like a fascist plane to me, right? And what, what do they say? Death flies over Western Europe, United States bombers with hydrogen bombs circle Western Europe daily. Who needs H-bombs to defend their own country? The Americans are dreaming about a push-button war. All they do is push a button and then the bomb flies, you know, but 
the Soviets have intercontinental ballistic rockets and they'll defend us. Okay. <laughs> really? Planes flying over Belgium and, and Rome? No, no, they're not. NATO has airplanes stationed in Western Europe because of the Soviets who have the same thing. They are not circling Western Europe trying to kill Western Europeans. That's what they said, right? So now, how? We now know that the West is dangerous and very, very, very out. They, they will come for us any minute now because they're fascists. Everybody hates a fascist, right? Why would we talk with the West? They're fascists. So now, how do we remilitarize? Well, we all know that the, fas that the fascists in the West are really, really bad. Well, here is the first article, March 17, 1956, um, 16 days after the founding of the East German army. Here they're only talking about the border guards, right? And what, what do they do? Well, they, they defend us against West German saboteurs and agents, right, who bring in propaganda, who try to destroy us, and smugglers who, you know, take all of this good stuff that we have and they smuggle it to the West. Ah, sure. The East German economy <laughs> is probably much better than the West German economy, right? So um, it is okay to, again, be armed with your, you know, um, Soviet machine gun here uh, with the Soviet helmet, actually, right? It's uh, cover yourself up in camo. Yeah, we're, we're into that, right? From Traktor zur Volksarmee. Very, very small article here, but it tells you that this farm boy who just learned how to take apart a tractor and put it back together, he will now join the new people's army, right? And he will put the uniform on and he'll become a tanker. Remember, this is a very unpopular military. People don't want to want to join that, right? Uh, anecdotal evidence from my own family: you you're forced to join the East German military. You don't want to do that, right? Okay. Oh yeah, this is Gruß und Glückwunsch unseren Soldaten. Greetings and congratulations to all soldiers. March first is the day of the National People's Army, uh, right? Fun fact. Today, Russian SFB trolls still congratulate former East Germans on Facebook on that day. <laughs> Congratulations, former East German military. Yeah, looks like you're trying to split the German society into two here, and your Russian friends and non-Russian friends. It still works, right? If you look at this soldier, this is supposed to be an East German soldier. Anything about this guy looks Russian. Uh, you know, that, that helmet is a fantasy helmet that never really existed. It actually looks like a pre-World War II Soviet model. Um, the fact that he plays the accordion, very Russian. Soviet soldiers always depicted with the accordion when, when they were fun and job. And as you see here, this is good soldier. He's playing songs, right? Protects the kids, you know, yay military. Remilitarization. Let's make this work. And it's awesome because we have the bestest technology and our tankers go to school and they learn technology and like these, you know, military cabinets here, you know, all oh, highly technological stuff, right? And they have the T-34, right? The tank that defeated the Nazis. So now we have this awesome stuff, right? So the one year old army has new schools and no modern equipment. So what they're trying to tell the kids is modernity. Awesome stuff, you know, super awesome technology. And then they really overdo it, right? Um, I will talk about the uniforms that these guys are wearing in just a little bit more, right? But this is a school for young cadets, right? With the cadets in Naumburg, and this article is all about discipline. Um, which group is in bed first contest, right? So they're so disciplined that, you know, they're organized in their rooms, you know, so many boys in one room, and they have fights, you know, room against room. Who is in bed first? Really? <laughs> I want to be the most disciplined. Hmm, yeah. <laughs> this school was really, really problematic. Uh, the Kadettenanstalt in Malmoor housed a Adolf Hitler school before. The children in the school um, you know, I read up on that a little bit, right? There have been publications about this. Uh, they're not all communist. Some people, some parents send their kids into the school because they like militarism. <laughs> and their parents were also in the military, in the Nazi military, right? So uh, this school was popular with the wrong 
sections of East German society, and that's why they send their children there. They're dressed as little Prussians, right? It's really like Prussians, I guess. Um, November 15th, 1957. Uh, this, this was fun. On November 7, workers of the entire world celebrated the victory of the October Revolution with demonstrations and joyful celebrations. I don't care what you do with the Soviet, you know, yeah, in Soviet Russia, they had a military parade. And what they show here, again, is technology, um, inter uh, transcontinental inter those rockets <laughs> included transcontinental ballistic rockets. So rockets that go from Russia, you know, over the ice cap and, and you know, over Alaska and then can attack uh, the United States, right? So dangerous stuff. You can put a H-bomb on that, right? Technology. Wow. You know, the Russians have that. Oh, what else do the Russians have? Oh my God! You know, so this is the, for the 40th anniversary of the Red Army, right? So you have a little article about the newest technologies: um, jet fighters, recoilless artillery, airborne tanks, submarines. Wow! You know, who would not want to join a military that has all that fun stuff, right? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's it. You know. Uh, all the young pioneers greet all soldiers and officers uh, on the day of the military, right? Um, it will be an unforgettable experience for every young pioneer to get to know the modern weapons and equipment of our army for themselves. And who does not dream of defending our socialist fatherland in such a vehicle? Look at this guy. Look at his uniform. Even this hat here kind of looks like the more 1943 hat that the, the Nazi military had, right? So. Looks like a German uniform, not really, right? And it looks like Soviet military equipment, right? So dressed up, a dressed up Russian army. So from Nazis to Red Prussians, does that really work? Or do they have mistakes every now and then that they didn't realize, right? So you saw what the uniforms looked like, right? A little bit earlier, this teeny tiny article was in the newspaper. This is of interest to us from, uh, from soldier to general, right? So from the regular soldier, private to, to a general, right? The new uniforms of our National People's Army are equivalent to German traditions. Really? Right? Why, why does, uh, no, what does it mean uh, that our army wears its uniform according to the old traditions? Uh -huh. Major Tyler will answer this question in one of the uh, following issues. I looked. No one explained. <laughs> the uniforms show up, and you wonder, wow, they really look like Wehrmacht soldiers in these uniforms. What were they doing? No explanation. They went too far. <laughs> Every now and then, you know, remember that the, the parents of these children, they went through the war, right? And every now and then you find evidence that's like, oh my God, uh, there was a letter from a young girl, right? Her name was Sieg Run. You know what a Sieg Run is? Those lightning bolts that the SS were wearing on their, that's a Sieg Run. The Hitler Youth had a single lightning bolt on their belt buckles. Sieg Run sounds like a German name, it's not. And so this young pioneer Sieg Run is just writing a letter, as right? so you say, oh my god, you know exactly what the parents were thinking when they named their girl, right? So what were they thinking? Yeah, right. It goes, you know, here. What were they thinking? October 6, 1956. Uh, what shall the new pioneer clothing look like? They didn't call it a uniform. Pioneer Kleidung is, is kind of pioneer uniform. It's kind of pioneer Kleidung. Uh, how about, you know, we have a couple of suggestions of what we do here. These are discussion starters, right? If you read the fine print here, I was like, oh my God, right? Improvements are possible. Uh, some models here printed as discussion starter. Summer clothing should be made of rugged sand colored material. Rugged sand colored material with the black scarf as it looks like it. This looks like a Hitler Youth uniform. 100%. So, does that. Uh, the darker version for the winter months, right? What were they thinking? They weren't thinking. And it didn't, it didn't get nowhere, of course. You know, the pioneer uniform always stayed the same, white shirt, red scarf, right? But making it brown, whoa, they weren't thinking at all, right? Oh, yeah, here, another attempt to, to change the uniform to something different, right? 
A pioneer should also wear a uniform. To recognize us, one should be able to buy a uniform by showing the pioneer ID card. So that's what the Nazis did. <laughs> you join the Hitler Youth, you have the documentation, you then are allowed to go to an officially licensed Nazi store and get yourself a Hitler Youth uniform. How about we do the same thing? How about the color should be dark so that it doesn't soil so easy? If we really do that, we will dress, yeah, just like the grown-ups would will look like Hitler Youth. And this is really, wow. It is March 8th, 1957, International Women's Day. And there's a whole page of, you know, little kids thanking their moms. Hab dank, Mutti. Thanks, Mom, right? So Mutti is explaining, you know, she, she takes, you know, in order to, to, you know, PE all the time, and she likes sports, and then she says this. From my 10th year until 1945, I was active in sports myself. Okay, you were part of the Bund Deutscher Mädel. When you were 10, you joined the Nazi organization. And when the war was over in 1945, you weren't part of the BDM anymore. She basically said in so many words that she was very active in the Hitler Youth and did sports. <laughs> why? This is really, why? This is, it uh, doesn't make any sense. So how do we package that for little kids? And you've seen a lot of stuff. I've shown you over 20 slides here. How do we package that? Well, every now and then we put in a little bit of Western popular culture, film, right, stuff like that, to, to kind of make this pill easier to swallow. Because you saw my reactions, and if you know the background, if your parents are you know, if they lived through the Nazi dictatorship, you know, then they know what this is all about. And they explain that to you. So fun for kids. The last page is always a comic. Um, the dog Piff is very popular among the children in France, Belgium, and Italy, right? So they actually, I don't know if they copyrighted this or not, but this is from a Western newspaper. Ultimately, they come up with this East German uh, artist that does the same thing. You know, he can do that too. Here, it gets really messed up, right? Uh, this is a, a portrait of a very, very popular West German actor, Heinz Rühmann. Heinz Rühmann made his movie debut in Nazi Germany. He made escapist movies for Goebbels' propaganda machine when the Nazis were losing the war. Escapist movies are... La, 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 everything is fine, beautiful color movies, you know, entertainment, love stories, right? Uh, Crux der Bruchpilot was, was one of his famous movies in which he kind of made a little bit of propaganda for the German Air Force, right? So um, a favorite of a favorite of the movie buffs, right? So they explain who he is, where he was born, nothing about what he did in Nazi Germany, right? So they're just putting this in here. A famous West German actor. Ta -da! Here's another one, Hardy Krüger. You, Maybe you guys remember him. He made it big in Hollywood as well, right? Yeah, yeah, Harry Krieger. He, as a young, young kid, he also showed up in Nazi movies. He made a movie, Young Eagles, in which he, as a young Hitler youth flyer, you know, is doing stuff for the Nazis. And here now, Schauspieler Adressen, you can, you can uh, write him, write and ask for his, for his autograph, right? Um, yeah. So let's go back. I presented you with my evidence. I gave you my research questions. Now let's figure out if we can come up with a good analysis of what we just saw, right? So remember the Texas boy and the US Air Force bomber? The, the messages that we get are inconsistent, right? So inconsistencies are very common. Um, East German youths followed Western fashions. The Texas boy was just a normal kid who followed Western fashions and music. Uh, these Western actors, Ruhmann and Krüger, opened windows for Western culture into East German life. It was okay to watch a West German film with a former Nazi actor. Okay. Uh, Ruhmann and Krüger also portrayed real Nazis on film. Don't you think that the parents of those kids knew that? They also watched movies back in Nazi Germany. They knew who these guys were, right? So East German cadets and soldiers look like Nazi soldiers. This is inconsistent. It doesn't make any sense. Does it make sense to you? Hang on. So the four main points in Soviet propaganda for little East Germans, a conclusion. We're trying to conclude here, right? 
East Germany is a democracy, West Germany is a fascist state. It's a fact that propaganda is trying to give to you all the time. Remilitarization of East Germany is necessary to defend democracy from fascism. Okay. The paper tests out ideas. Too heavy-handed indoctrination becomes ineffective. So should we find out why we're wearing the uniforms? Or should Major Tyler not explain? No, Major Tyler shouldn't explain. We'll just look at the pictures, right? Okay. Um, propaganda packages, the messages were packaged in sport, literature, adventure, song, dance, science, and even cartoons and actors' portraits from the West. And here's my general conclusion. What can we learn about Soviet propaganda? Soviet propaganda is the same in World War I, during the Cold War, and today. It is. The fascist West is aggressive and needs to be defeated even in Ukraine today. Marxism is a closed ideology based on science. Marx said, the proletarian revolution will come once everybody is a worker. The proletarian revolution didn't happen in Soviet Russia because the revolution in Russia was fought by a peasant army, right? This is not Marxism, this is Stalinism what we have in the Soviet Union, right? Stalinism, however, is Russian imperialism thinly veiled as Marxism. This leads to inconsistencies, right? Stalinist propaganda is class-based. It's not the West, but certain social classes in the West that make up the enemy. So this is a tool to mitigate the inconsistencies that come with this propaganda, right? So there's always a grain of truth, as for instance, legitimate Marxist claims about capitalism. The people in the West are unhappy because they're all starving. <sighs> yeah, capitalism is not perfect, but no, kids in West Germany weren't starving and they were quite happy, right? So what we have here is projecting, 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 right? Uh, we have a grain of truth that gets blown up and then we project. Soviet propaganda is projecting. The things the Soviet do, aggressive, aggressively building an empire, they accuse the Americans of. And that's all I had. <laughs> Does that make sense? The SFB hasn't changed. They, they have the same story. And it's inconsistent if you don't know the background. But if you do know the background, and you know that the Soviets would never have won the Second World War without the, Second World War without the Americans, the Americans allowed the Soviets to win. Then the Soviets took the spoils of the Second World War. They had atomic weapons, right, that they wouldn't have without the Second World War, transcontinental ballistic rockets that they wouldn't have without German scientists, right? All of that stuff makes a superpower out of them. And they hold on to their superpower empire with violence and propaganda for over 40 years, right? Then the Cold War comes, they lose the Cold War, and now what we have is a resurgence of aggressive empire building that we see in the Kremlin today. Thank you. Do you guys have questions? <laughs> I know I probably talked a little bit too long. But You're fine. Okay. Are there other publications that people could read that will counteract this propaganda? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, as I said, the, the Germans and the other Germans were on the fault lines of the Cold War. So the people that the East Germans here make fun of, um, Chancellor Adenauer, for instance, you know, um, uh, the West German military, of course, they had their own publications and they called a spade a spade. <laughs> but then these guys did their own thing, right? So yeah, absolutely. So you had the truth on, on radio, on uh, West German uh, newspapers that got smuggled in. You know, the Iron Curtain was very, very permeable for ideas at least. You know, so. uh, what was your personal experience with this propaganda? Did you have to read this paper? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, my personal experience was um, you join school. When you were seven years old, you joined the Young Pioneers in your school group. You're always organized. Your teacher is the, the group leader, and your, your class is your group. Um, we got this newspaper handed to us. We had to pay for it, 10 pennies, uh, every week. 
and it was distributed in school. So it's not like I got the dang thing and read it and ha ha ha. No, it was handed to us. And yes, you either read it or not. But the teacher always quizzed you. Did you read this? And there's an article about this communist leader. You got so you got quizzed. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Um, double talk, right? So you need to be able to explain the Soviet viewpoint like that, right? And you need to, but at home you see West German television, right? Um, my family was not party members. <laughs> um, when you step into the school, you tell them what they want to hear. Right. It's very annoying, but you know, we had West German television, and the things that I saw on West German television were much more interesting than a Soviet tank or a, a stupid East German folk song. You know, we wanted back then Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? that was awesome. You know? So it was boring. It was put upon us and very ineffective by the late 80s. Were you graded? I mean, did they, did they grade you on your answers? Yes. Um, there's, there's a big test of life <coughs> where you make it to college, right? If, if only if you consistently repeat the lies, you are allowed to go to college. If you are a rebel and you are someone that dresses like a Texas boy or talks about West German television all the time, then you get bogged down. You're not allowed to go to college. Um, we also had a subject called Staatsbürgerkunde, how to be a good citizen of East Germany. Uh, and that's where you really learned all of that stuff. You know, yeah. We were quizzed on that. So they had gatekeepers checking you on your propaganda. Absolutely. A few years ago, I seem to remember reading that sometime in the 50s, uh, Lavrenti Beria was sent to East Germany to try to persuade Hanukkah to give up his position and reunite Germany. Is there any truth to that? The, mm, no, uh, yes and no. Early on, they didn't know that Stalin was, there was no playbook for the Cold War. So originally what he tried to do is keep Germany neutral. That didn't work. Uh, the Americans allowed West Germans to rearm. Then the East Germans rearmed. So it was a reaction. Then Stalin thought, how about we offer a demilitarization of all of Germany and you take West Germany out of NATO? You know, basically taking NATO weapons out of West Germany makes it easier for the Russians to, if they actually do come and push, right? So the idea was, let's keep it neutral. But then the West Germans are not idiots either. No, we have protection here. NATO is a defensive alliance. That's what NATO always was and always will be. NATO is not something that attacks, <laughs> right? So NATO was too scary for the Soviets. They tried to neutralize it by making all of Germany a neutral state. And they said, you can't even reunite. But then the West Germans didn't want that. And that's why Stalin then said, nah, OK, East Germany is a state. Right? So you show um, this propaganda from both the Nazi side and, and Soviet side. Are there other examples that you know, like in the US even right now, where people are trying to use propaganda against children or with children to get their political views yes. or their- uh, very good. Thank you. Um, it is, and I don't want to leave myself in the window here and say, yeah, this, this party does this and this party does that. What I see, on the news here is that Republicans and Democrats call each other fascists and Nazis, and they're neither. <laughs> You're all American. But we are at a time where appealing to emotion becomes popular again. And that's what these people did. They appeal to emotions, right? Uh, Marx was right, uh, the West is exploiting, and we are strong and we're holding together. And this appealing to emotions and uh, tossing words and slogans at each other. You're a fascist. Why would I talk to you? Fascists killed six million Jews. Fascists, you know, are not people that we sit and compromise with. And that's what we have again in everywhere. In the West, in you know, in, in Europe, you have people that want to you know snip away at democracy. Hungary, Poland. You have people like Erdogan, for instance, you know, that is part of NATO, but really is not really into democracy. Yes, you're absolutely right. This propaganda is very visible by, you know, slogans and emotions. Is anybody targeting children? Do, I mean, do you see yes. that? Yes. Out yes. In schools or in certain. Um, I recently have. Okay, my son is looking at what? It's my wife. Lena, what is you? Videos. 
So there are videos, teeny tiny videos that my son watches on, on his iPhone that are grains of truth that are blown up, taken out of context, repeated, repeated, uh, you know, at lies added. Yes, yes, that exists. I'm sorry. That young man. Uh, in 1987, I was on a tour of East Berlin, and this was two years before the the wall came down, and we stopped at the Pergamon Museum. Yes. Uh, the Museum of Greek Antiquities. Yes. A part of it had been destroyed during the war, and what we saw was this huge pit, that, you know, and the East German guide told us that they were being very, very careful to sift through all this debris to stay the south. But see what what you saw, you know, you you know, take an airplane from the United States, you go to Germany, and then you fly into Berlin and you see West Berlin. And you know, uh, the entire city was raised by, you know, by the Air Force and, and the Royal Air Force. Um, so what you see in the West is new infrastructure everywhere. Everything is pretty and you know neon colors, yeah. and it's a window. It's a shop window, you know, for for East Germans to to see. So when you then cross the um, the border, the Soviets took everything away from us, right? The West Germans had a Marshall Plan, and we had Soviets who took from us, <laughs> and we still had somewhat of an East German uh, economic miracle. But what we had was incompatible and you couldn't compare that to the riches of the west so you know we had infrastructure that was from the nazis we had locomotives like steam locomotives that the nazis put in place our heating system was you know original 1936 you know so that's why what you saw in the in east germany was not horrible gray falling apart you know and in the west everything looks awesome yes so, absolutely right but we couldn't see that. They they lied to us. They said we live in paradise, and everybody in the West is, you know. Great. Um, you linked Russian propaganda to the conflict in Ukraine. Yes. And something that I find this interesting is, first of all, my mom was born in 1958, so she was exposed to that. And um, in Eastern Germany, there is a tendency to support the attack on Ukraine on the Russian side, and there is also this thing going on with like Ostalgi. I like, I like your accent, young man. When you come. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but what's that going on? Do you think that maybe this propaganda was more effective than we think we wanted? Like, do you think there's a link? Yes, absolutely. Capitalism is hard, right? It's a dog eat dog world. And in East Germany, um, hated or not, you know, whatever, uh, you had a social net that you could not possibly fall through, even if you tried. Everybody had a job. You couldn't possibly be a bum on the street, right? Okay, uh, we didn't have political rights, but after 20 years or 30 years now, some people tend to forget that because capitalism is hard. And if you lose your job, right? And if uh, your government is not helping you, then you have a tendency to blame anyone and everything on your, on your plight, but yourself. So there are many Aussies, East Germans, former friends of mine, you know, that that argue, yeah, capitalism sucks. Uh, all of Germany is now Americanized, and you know, look what they did to us. Um, ultimately, you know, yeah, the, the the Soviets have, the Russians have a right to do that. This is why I did this. This explains why the Russians are imperialists and not Marxists. And if you are trying to tell me from a Marxist viewpoint that what the Russians are doing is right, then that is a lie because the Russians are imperialists. And yes, the East Germans are falling for that. Hence that Facebook stuff. We congratulate all four East Germans. And yeah, some of them fall for that stuff. There is a huge fight going on on Facebook, right? And there are these Russian trolls. And these messages fall on fertile soil because capitalism is hard and the losers of the vendor, you know, the, the people that lost everything when, when the East German state went away, they are blaming the West. I argue that it's not the West, 
it's your personal problem. Democracy is not the root of your economic problems. <laughs> and look at Russia, come on. Yeah, thank you. Very good question, thank you. Larry, go ahead. I was like, and, uh, you were saying how they call the West Nazis, but yet they have their own army and uh, wore Vermont or Prussian type uniforms. And then they even kept the old party style, because I know I was lot like, if you look at the Western German military, they were more brought with more uh, American military equipment or NATO standards. And then as well, um, you always think of when you think of Germany, you think of the uh, goose stepping. Yes. And also with Russia and uh, in Western Germany, they got rid of that. They still had some of the old Prussian marching styles, like we swing ours back and forth. They swing more in front, but then also they adopted the more style with their feet, they with the more Western, like the French, or like how Americans march. They don't. You absolutely like that. But it's, it's just ironic. They call the West Nazis, but yeah, the West tried to get rid of this name that looked. Thank you. By Nazi or Prussian standards. So what, what they were arguing is that we have Prussian military traditions. We know Prussian military traditions are very bad. The Soviets looked at the East German military at a, oh God, defense conference <clears throat> in the early 1950s. And it was the Soviet defense minister who approached the East German defense minister, and he said, look at your uniforms. They're brown, like ours. Think about it. You're a German. Think about that. So the East German military took that little conversation at the side of a conference as a justification to reintroduce Nazi-like uniforms into the, the uh, East German military. And they did that to make it look German. Um, they weren't, you know. So can I follow up on that? Absolutely. I, I, I think the most interesting, for me, the most interesting part of all of this is the way that they tried to make the propaganda connect to German roots, right? And I don't, I wonder if, if one could see it not so much as inconsistent, but as actually trying to appeal to the parents. Because parents read kids stuff too. In fact, if the parents hate it, the kids aren't going to read it. You're right. Right? And some of these parents probably were Nazis, as you pointed out. Right? So if they're trying to tell the parents, look, you know, we're in the Soviet bloc now, but we're still Germans. And even if you were a Nazi, we're all still in this together. Well, Maybe that's one way of doing that. And like bringing out the, the yes. Nazi um, film guy, right? The, the screen artist. Let's, let's not forget, the communists are on the moral high horse. They are the only ones who follow them. The Social Democrats gave up, right? They said, okay, whatever, we'll go into hiding. The communists, in during the Nazi dictatorship, actively fought and went into concentration camps. When they, you know, yeah. were released out of the camps, they were happy to see the Soviets. Ha ha, we will make, we will establish a better East German state. That was the big goal. That was the idea. And you know, the big caveat is here for, for everyone. Why don't we believe these stories? Why don't we say that everybody in the West is a fascist and we're all good proletarians? Why don't we swallow this class warfare story that we're all workers and we, even during the Nazi dictatorship, you know, all we wanted to do is, you know, have our red flag that we're hiding, you know. We've always, always all been communist. That's the story that is given and then taken, and, you know, and we are the better Germans. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, they are the better Germans, but clearly not everybody was. No. And they also know that. And they Absolutely. And get them to buy into it. Absolutely. It's so inconsistent. Say, yeah, okay, you know, some of you are, were fascists, but, but now let's be Germans, right? And you can work along yep. with this by, yep. and I this, just wonder if that can play into it. And this is, this is where the 60s, yeah. the yeah. 70s, the 80s, at that point of time, it's so yeah. obvious what's yeah. going on, and who's the aggressor here, and, you know. Mm -hmm. You get to talk in the West about communists. You even get to vote for a communist party in West Germany, but you know, you try to do anything like that. Maybe. The other thing I would suggest is looking at who's actually writing this stuff. <laughs> Very good. That's a good question. Um, they always act like, you know, little Siegmund is writing the letter in. <laughs> no, usually those are editors and they're testing. They're testing stories. Does this work? Does this work? Somebody makes a movie, right? And then that movie falls through the, um, the propaganda committee, right? It's, it's too, too open. So they show the movie 
to a certain audience and then somebody writes a letter to the editor. This movie sucks. How could you possibly show this movie? And then the movie gets taken out. So yes, the articles in itself and the people who write it are not real people sometimes. Oh, I just had a quick follow up to that question then. So if the people who are the Nazis or former Nazis or just don't like the state are obviously not buying into this, is this kind of a situation like um, the carrot of the stick, the propaganda is the carrot. You verbalize what they want you to and everything is good, but then there's the threat of violence or punishment in some way yeah. underneath. Yeah, if you, if you don't, and that's something that you learn as an East German. Uh, this is not something that they put into propaganda, but if you don't follow, if you have an uprising, you end up either, uh, capital punishment is a thing, they killed some people from 1953, you can also go to Siberia and end up in a camp, or you end up later on in one of those Stasi jails, you know, so the East German secret police, they also had jails. And if you did something as a young child that wasn't popular, then you would get reported and you can also get uh, brought to kitty jail, Jugendwerkhof, jails for children, in which horrible, horrible things happened to little kids. I mean, we're talking rape, for instance, that was normal, right? Um, that's what happened if you don't buy into it. So everyone knew that. After the uprising in 1953, no one in East Germany ever de-Stalinized. We were real Stalinist until the end of the Cold War. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, it was scary, right? But it was double talk and it was very easy. All you have to do is repeat the crap and go, mm. yeah. <laughs> right? It's all they want is lip service. It's not like the Nazis. You're not getting put into a concentration camp right away. Lip service is enough. Thank you. Thank you so much.